Yesterday we looked at how uh, both noise and jitter can cause better error, right? Noise because it can uh, take uh, the voltage corresponding to a certain symbol and then uh, make its polarity opposite of what it was. In a binary case, in uh, more number of levels, it can take it to some other level. Okay, basically the noise can make the uh, input cross the threshold in some direction. Then jitter is also the same way. It could be that you cross the bit boundary while doing this. Okay. Now, later we will see that the input also does not look exactly rectangular. So, uh, these things will matter even more. Okay. Uh, the bottom line is depending on uh, the ratio of uh, the voltage corresponding to the symbol value to the noise RMS or half the period to the jitter RMS, uh, there will be a certain bit error rate. So, that means that uh, for a given data rate and a given transmitted uh, symbol amplitude, you have to have uh, you have to have the noise or jitter to be smaller than a certain value. Okay. In addition to that, you saw that uh, systematic offsets or systematic skews. That is, either the threshold is not exactly at zero in between the levels, or the sampling is not in the middle of the eye. Those will also increase the bit errors, right? Because you are skewed to one side, so the likelihood of going off to this side or uh, upper or lower uh, level is higher, so that will increase the better. So, those also have to be limited. Okay. So, later when we do what is known as link budgeting, we will look at all of these things. There are some uh, noise like phenomenon, which have this long tail distribution. right? The noise variance can be small, but however small it is, there is a certain probability that it uh, crosses a certain threshold. right? And there are other things, which uh, do not have that infinitely long distribution. They will uh, be like offset, they will shift the signal by a certain amount. So, both of these have to be limited to some values. So, when we do link budgeting, we will see that. Okay. Now, I mentioned that we will look at eye diagrams, but uh, we will postpone it for now. We will first look at uh, how to do, how to figure out whether the clock is really in the center of the data, data, data or not. Okay. So, like I said, let us consider a case where we have a transmitter, a channel and a receiver. Okay. So, this is sending data something like this and then we also have uh, this is for data and for clock we have a separate channel. So, Right, so, this tries to send the clock that is synchronized to the data. Okay. So, in principle, if you get both this and that, there is nothing to do. You feed this to the D input, you feed this to the clock input, it will sample the values here, there, there and so on and you will get the right kind of uh, right uh, symbols. Okay. Now, what is the problem? When it goes through a channel, it experiences some delays and distortions, okay, both uh, clock and data. Let us take a very simple case. Let us say the channel is just an RC low pass filter. Okay. So, now if I send a series of uh, rectangular symbols like this, what do you think will happen? What will if uh, this is the input, what will the output look like? Huh? Yeah, every step will start in exponential uh, from wherever it was. Okay. So, initially let me assume that it was here and it will start in exponential and how the exponential is depends on the time constant. Okay. The if the time constant is longer, it will go slower and so on. So, let me also imagine some time constant like this. Something like that. Okay. And maybe it will go there and here it has a chance to fully settle. 
let me show it slightly differently go there and come here and it will do that here it will fully settle so here it will go to a different value and so on ok now if you <coughs> look at the zero crossings of uh, the input and the zero crossings of the output ok you will easily see that this delay is different for different cases right because they are starting from different initial conditions at least if you have a string of ones what will happen is there is enough time for data to settle to the final value and then it starts from there but if you have a single one it will not have enough time i mean that depends on the time constant let's assume that the time constant is like that then it will start from so for instance here it is not starting from minus 1 it is starting from a little bit above that right whereas here it is starting from plus 1 so you expect that this delay tau 1 is more than tau 2 ok. So, first of all uh, this means that uh, although the, the black one here the input the transitions of the input are at integer multiples of d s right. Let us assume that they are ideal, but the transitions of the output are not at integer multiples of d s they are spread around that one ok. So, they will be jittered in the data itself ok. So, the zero crossings will go back and forth. Now, that is fine. Now, what about the clock? If you send a clock through it exact same exact same uh, RC filter let us assume that the two channels are exactly matched what will happen here? it will be again be exponential, but because in this case the input is periodic the output will be periodic every period will look the same, but of course you have only half the time. So, it may look something like this huh? because uh, this is starting from uh, uh, so the, the initial value is not minus 1 it is something more than that and it is going up whereas because of a string of ones this has gone and settled to plus 1 and it has to come down from there. So, this distance is longer than that distance. So, correspondingly the delay is also longer ok. So, in case of a clock it will do this it is periodic ok. So, there should be no jitter in that the zero crossings of the output are also at integer multiples of T s by 2 ok they are only shifted right. So, now you see that although the original clock was aligned perfectly to the original data the output of the channel will not be aligned perfectly to the data because data is a random signal ok. First of all uh, for data the zero crossings are not even periodic ok they will go back and forth is that easy to see or any further explanation is necessary is that ok. That is uh, what I am claiming is that these are the transition points of the input data and these are the transition points of the output data. The distance between them depends on the history whether there was a single one before or whether there were multiple ones or so on ok. Now, if I uh, the input could also be the input can be anything it is random data right. So, if the input is periodic that is a 1 0 1 0 pattern this is also one of the possible inputs right. Then the output will also be periodic ok. So, in this case the zero crossings of this output will be uh, equally spaced spaced at the symbol interval, but even in this case the spacing between the, the delay between the input uh, the delay, be delay between the zero crossing of data right at the input and output and the delay between uh, the clock zero crossings will be different ok because they are just uh, like square waves with different periods is this ok because the amplitude of this the clock will be smaller I mean there is not enough time to go down compared to this one there is twice as much time here compared to this one right. So, the delays will be different 
in addition to that you will not be sending periodic data. So, in data you also have the zero crossings going back and forth around a certain average value. Is this clear? So, what this means is even if you send the clock you are uh, being a very good transmitter you send the clock you say just take this clock and clock the data, but even then there is a problem because of skews. Okay. So, at the receiver it will not be aligned. Now, by the way this is a very simple RC case and we assume that the two are matched. The actual channel can be very complicated and the delay through the channel can be very long. The delay itself can be multiples of a bit period. Okay. So, let us say we are talking about uh, 10 gigabits per second data. Okay. What is the period? How much is the period? Huh? 100 picoseconds. Okay. Now, what is the length of a wire that will give you 100 picoseconds delay? Now, what is the speed of light? Yeah. So, you can think of it that way. I mean, when you are looking at real units, maybe you say 300 meters per microseconds or 300 millimeters per nanosecond or 300 micron per picosecond. Okay. So, how much delay do you need for 100 picoseconds? How much uh, length do you need for 100 picoseconds? Huh? 30 millimeters. I mean, this is 300 millimeters per nanosecond. So, for 0 0.1 nanoseconds, you need 30 millimeters. By the way, this is in air or vacuum. Okay. On a PCB, what will it be? Is the speed going to be higher or lower? Lower. By how much? Huh? Yeah. So, basically it depends on uh, the permeability and permittivity. So, the speed will be the speed of light in vacuum divided by square root of the relative permeability times relative permittivity. Okay. Now, relative permeability is typically 1 for all this and relative permeability permittivity it can be anything, but let us say 4. Okay. So, it will be half the speed. Okay. So, these are good things to remember. Okay. I mean it is not that you have to remember it, but if you only think of it as 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, it is hard to imagine these numbers, but you can see that the amount of uh, distance you have to travel for 100 picoseconds is not that much. It is basically 15 millimeters or so on a PCB. Okay. 15 millimeters is 1.5 centimeters, it is quite short and you can have traces which are many tens of uh, centimeters. Okay. So, the delay will be much longer. So, what happens when the delay is much longer also is you cannot uh, typically uh, you will have a long uh, line for the data, another long line for the clock and you cannot match them exactly. right? Uh, usually the routing constraints and so on make you uh, have make them have slightly different lengths. There are all kinds of constraints because uh, you may have to route things over uh, in, a, in, a, in different orientations and so on. Right? For instance, if you have two chips like this and then you have pins let us say all over here, okay, you can without any experience imagine that it is not easy to connect these things to with same lengths. Many times you try to do that like for instance, uh, this is the longest one. This would be the shortest, but you deliberately introduce some uh, bend so that it becomes equal. Even then, they'll not be exactly equal. So it's very easy to pick up skews in the uh, few picoseconds and so on on a PCB. Okay, so there'll be skews also because of uh, channels uh, mismatch, and there'll be other things as well. The channel on the board is not the only thing. The bond wires inside, all these things will also cause some errors. So in general, even if you send the clock the channels will not be exactly same as each other in the context that we are looking at. Okay. If it is the same then there is no problem all you need is a deep flip flop at the receiver. Okay. If it is not the same then <coughs> the frequency is correct it is exact because it is the same clock that generated the data, but the clock is not centered at the data and you have to move it back uh, back and forth. Okay. So, the way to do that is so this goes to the D input. Now, this can go to the clock, but we know that it is not at the correct delay. So, maybe you need to 
have a variable delay for the clock and what you have to do is measure the phase difference okay and uh, using this information you go on adjusting the delay okay until the clock is centered on the data okay so this is what is known as clock recovery and also data recovery because this flip flop output gives you the data okay so essentially now we are at a, in a situation where the channels are long and although you send a clock you cannot guarantee that the data and clock are delayed by exactly the same amount so they can be skewed by quite a bit in addition to this the data itself has uh, some uncertainty because of its randomness okay uh, so all these things combined uh, require that you have a variable delay and somehow adjust the variable delay so that the clock is centered on data okay so in a sense this is what every clock recovery circuit does you have to somehow find the phase difference between data and clock and continuously adjust the phase of the clock so that it goes and matches the data when i say matches it is whatever it's supposed to be in our case we want the rising edge to be in the middle of the uh, data period that's what it's going to be okay any questions here yeah go ahead it's a it can be a bus so if it is a bus you will need uh, this arrangement for every lane okay because the skew may be different for uh, uh, every lane what he is asking is i mean you can have eight data bits and one clock okay, there is no point sending eight clocks right all of them are generated from the same but uh, the delay for each of those eight will be different so that means that uh, your clock recovery circuit also should be uh, different from Yeah, let's see what uh, we need. So clearly, uh, one of the crucial elements here is the phase difference measurement circuit. Okay. So how do we measure the phase between uh, two signals? Right. So that is part of it. So actually, if you look at it, I mean, it it has everything that uh, is required for clock recovery. You need a variable delay because you don't know where the clock should be, so you go on varying it, and you need a phase detector. That's all, right? So, how would we measure phase difference between two signals? Yeah, XOR gate. Then what else? So any other? What's that? So some other answer. What is that? Multiplication. Okay. Oh yeah, that's uh, that's what I asked you. What is the phase difference? How does it work? So anyway, let's see. So uh, the answers were XOR gate and multiplier and so on. Actually, XOR gate and multiplier are exactly the same thing. How does this measure phase? XOR gate. I mean, what are the inputs? Data and clock. Okay. three state phase detector and so on right there are a number of uh, phase detectors that are used they are actually used to measure phase difference between two periodic signals okay both are periodic and there is a phase difference and the out average value of the output is a measure of the phase difference okay the difference here is that the two inputs are not periodic we have data which is not periodic and a clock which is periodic so this kind of solution doesn't quite work okay <coughs> Is this clear? So we have uh, 
you can also try it with uh, XOR gate it does not uh, does not quite work that way ok. If you have two periodic signals that is fine then uh, the average value of the XOR gate output or the multiplier output multiplier and XOR gate are basically the same thing uh, or uh, any three state phase detector that will work, but all those things are designed for uh, detecting phase differences between uh, uh, periodic signals ok. Whereas, here we need to find the phase difference between uh, data which is random essentially we want to find the time difference or phase difference between uh, the transitions of the data transition edges that is the only place where we have timing information right ok. I mean <coughs> if the data is like this let us say I and mean, what can I tell if let us say this is 1 nanosecond long I and mean, I have no information here I do not know whether these are uh, 10 bits at 10 gigabits per second or is it just 1 bit at 1 gigabit per second or 20 bits at uh, 20 gigabits per second I do not have anything. It is only in the transitions that we have information. So, it is from the timing of the transitions that we have to do the phase detection, but the transitions may or may not be there ok in random data uh, in every uh, uh, between every pair of bits uh, there can be a transition with a probability of half ok. So, you have to essentially do the phase detection only when there is a transition otherwise there is no information to do the phase detection ok. The number of schemes have been worked out which uh, work well that is what we will look at ok. I will draw rectangular waveforms here for uh, convenience in reality the waveforms that actually go into the phase detector may not be rectangular because of all these channel imperfections and circuit imperfections and so on ok. So, let me take uh, usual some random data stream like this. A perfectly aligned clock would be like that. And clock that is skewed to the right side that means that this is a clock that is too late right. The ideally the clock is supposed to be here, but this clock is there ok. <coughs> this is too late ok and then uh, you can also have an early clock which is earlier than the ideal place ok. So, now uh, what we, so the data transitions are here. So let's say this one, this one, this one, and then there is no transition. There is a transition there. Okay. So what can you say about the data and clock when they are perfectly aligned? By the way, I'll assume that the high and low periods of the clock are the same. This is actually this assumption can be violated sometimes, and sometimes in fact you have to take special measures to ensure that the clock indeed has this 50% duty cycle but we will now assume that it has 50 percent duty cycle ok. So, <coughs> what properties do you see when it is perfectly aligned? Now, when I say properties what I want is I want you to look at the only the transitions of the data and the clock or oh, it is only from that that we can uh, find out any information. So, what can you tell? I mean something that is true for a perfectly aligned clock, but not true for the uh, imperfect clock I mean misaligned clock and this is how you solve problems right you first look at it I mean let us say you like nobody had heard of clock recovery before or nobody heard of, heard of phase detection before you would do something like this you would draw the data and clock may be aligned and misaligned and then see what is it that will uh, distinguish the aligned case from the other cases what can you tell. 
no i know but what does it mean i mean i want to say something about the okay but you can't detect the midpoint of the data so you have to make a statement using only the transitions of the data and the edges of the data half of the clock period what is that hmm yeah that's correct that is true but uh, the thing is you don't have an absolute reference i mean let's say you somehow <coughs> have a measure of this that is the difference between this and that when i say a measure maybe there is some voltage that is proportional to this time but you don't know what that time is right i mean that absolute time you don't know i mean so you have to compare it to something else what will you compare it to you said i mean you are on the right track that it is half but where will you get that half period from okay it is always zero right the area under the clock curve over one period will always be zero i mean what he started was on the right track this should be half a period but you can't imagine some half period from somewhere you have to derive it from here where will you get that from yeah then okay what do you want to do with it what are you trying to do hmm yeah so basically so this should be ts by 2 okay but in general it is something else okay it is some uh, t1 let's say and you have to make t1 to be equal to ts by 2 so where will you get ts by 2 from it's very obvious right in fact he suggested that the distance between this if you simply look at the rising and falling edge of the clock that is ts by 2 okay so essentially you have to somehow make the distance between data transition and the rising edge to be equal to that between the rising and falling edge okay is that correct now we are using uh, information from only these signals we don't know what exactly t is but we all know that the data rising edge to the distance between the data transition to the rising edge of the clock should be the same as between the rising edge of the clock and the falling edge of the clock okay and you can i mean with this if you generalize something like this you can probably come up with circuits yourself and you are encouraged to try it out right but there is a popular phase detector which works exactly on this principle so what you do is the following first you use a rising edge uh, flip, uh, rising edge trigger flip flop to clock the data what will be the output what will be the output so let's say we have a we have the misaligned clock okay what will be the output of this what is this this is simple right what is what is it going to be i mean it's exactly the same as this except it will be the transitions will be aligned to the rising edge so So let's say you take this and then clock it with. I'll show you falling edge trigger flip flop. You may not need a full flip flop. A latch is enough here because the input is already latched. Okay. So this is Q1, Q2. Okay. 
So, what will be q 2? It is exactly the same thing, but uh, right. So, this is q 2. Now, what do you do with this? What could you do with this? In fact, you can see that you have data, you have q 1 which is the same as data, but its uh, transitions are coincident with the rising edge and q 2 which is also the same as data, but its transitions are coincident with the falling edge of the clock. Okay. So, the spacing between data and q 1 that is transitions of data and q 1 are the delay that you want to adjust and the spacing between transitions of q 1 and q 2 are T s by 2. So, you have to make the spacing between these two equal to the spacing between those two. So, how will you detect the spacing now? when you gave some earlier answers for the phase detector, what can you do? XOR. Okay. Now, the point is I mean you cannot XOR the data and clock uh, directly, because data has fewer transitions than the clock. Okay. Whereas, here all of them have the same transitions, but the transitions are spaced by something. So, if you take this XOR that, okay. I will call this up. What will this be? What will it be? What will it consist of? Yeah, it will be a pulse. The pulse will occur only when there is a data transition, right. When there is no data transition, this and this will be the same and there will be no pulse. So, at every data transition, there will be a pulse which uh, starts at the rising edge of starts at the transition point of the data and ends at the rising edge of the clock. Okay. So, similarly I think I need to draw figures a little more neatly or maybe So, it is exactly the same thing you can see that in this case uh, unlike what I drew I have taken a case where this clock is not at the center, but a little bit earlier than the center. Then I had drawn something that was later than the center. So, this is the input data okay, and this is the data whose uh, transitions are aligned to the rising edge that is called D 1 I called it Q 1 here and then uh, this is D 2 whose transitions are aligned to the falling edge. So, this up which is d x or d 1 right that will consist of a pulse that starts at the transitions of d and ends at the transitions of d 1 and this down which is d 1 x or d 2 starts at the transitions of d 1 and ends at the transitions of d 2. Okay. This will always have a fixed width of uh, T s by 2 right. and this will have a width equal to the delay between clock and data right. So, once the principle is known probably you can come up with different topologies which will do exactly the same thing. Okay. So, now what is it that your circuit has to do that uh, what is it that uh, your circuit needs to do? Where is the phase information in this whole thing? <coughs> what should happen when the phase is aligned? Huh? V out what is V out? Yeah, it is in the average, right. So, the area of this up should be equal to the area of down pulse, okay. Is this clear? So, it is the area that has to be uh, equal. So, that is when they will be aligned because they always have the same height, but the areas have to be the same, okay. So, that is why.
So, this is the circuit I have uh, d x for d 1 and d 1 x for d 2 and I subtract the 2 ok. You will get some pulses like this right it is positive here and negative there and so on. The way I have drawn it this uh, the up pulse is narrower than the down pulse. So, the average value of this will be negative ok. So, this we use this information later to adjust the clock in some way right. In fact, the re reason for uh, calling this up and down is that if the area of up is greater than area of down what does it mean? Does it mean that the clock is uh, too delayed or too advanced? If the area of uh, the up pulse is more than the area of the down pulse does it mean the clock is late or early? It is it is late it is late ok. So, you have to advance it. So, that is why it is called the up pulse and then similarly if the area of down is more than that of up the clock is too early and then you have to kind of slow it down ok or shift it the other way that is the reason for this terminology. So, that means that if up minus down is positive you have to advance the clock you have to pull it to the left and if up minus down is uh, uh, negative then you have to let it slide to the right side ok. Any questions here? So, this is the circuit let me assume that this V out will also be how many levels will be there in V out? Huh? 3 I mean it will be either plus minus some V naught or 0 ok. So, please plot the characteristic of this phase detector that is V out versus phi where phi what is phi? Phi is this it is the actually it is not this it is yeah it is the distance between the data transition and the rising edge of the clock ok. Sorry make it the distance between the data transition and falling edge of the clock ok. So, that means that if that is 0 that means it is perfectly aligned right. So, <coughs> this phi is So, if this is 0 it means it is perfectly aligned. So, please uh, calculate I want the characteristic with the correct scale factor ok and what is V out? V out is simply the average of up minus down ok.
perfectly alive. It means that theta equals pi or pi equals zero. Okay. So if you plot the characteristics, the average value versus pi will be a straight line. You can measure phase difference of between minus pi and pi. And as we saw, the slope will be denoted by 2 pi. And the extremes you will get denoted by 2 or minus 0 pi. Okay. When does this happen? You can imagine that first of all, I mean, here I have a thin numbers. It's even thinner, it becomes almost 0. Okay, so then what you have, you have a half cycle negative pulse. You will get minus half of the average. Or it's the other extreme that the rough spans the entire period. So you get a one cycle positive pulse and a half cycle negative pulse. So you get a half cycle positive as well average. Okay? This is fine. So we now have a phase detector which uh, detects phase between uh, periodic clock and uh, random data. Okay? And it has a linear characteristic with phi. And if you look at the average, when there are transitions, it will be like this. Of course, the transitions are not always present. Okay. So, if you take the long term average, what is the average going to be with actual random data, right? Assuming that the transition is there, we get these up and down pulses and you, we have the average that we calculated. But now, you also have to take the randomness of the data. Okay. So, how will you compute the average output? Yeah. So, it is basically this times the probability of transitions. Okay. So, again with random data without any further information, we will assume that this is half, but it may or may not be half. Okay. And the common term for this is it is known as the transition density factor D f. Okay. In the serial link literature, clock and data recovery literature, you keep seeing this density factor. That is the transition density factor. It is basically the probability of having a transition. Okay. <coughs> Can you have a density factor of 1? Hmm? I mean, what does it mean to have a data with density factor of 1? It is alternating data, 1 0, 1 0 pattern, right? So, then the density factor is 1. So, every transition is present. In fact, that is the best case for clock recovery because you have phase information in every cycle and yeah, the clock recovery will work uh, well. Okay, so we will continue from here. Please think about these things.